<laughs> so, people that make the world a better place. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, there's a group of people in this world known as reformers. And we're the gathering here in this place of Christians. And you know what? Not only does that sometimes meet, uh, according to Jesus, it should meet. And so when that happens, when people that, that see darkness, that are Christians, uh, follow Jesus, they become what Jesus called salt and light. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I want to go through this kind of systematically. And this week, we've had a big conversation going on in our community. And a big part of that conversation, in a very rational voice, someone that I was really proud of, the way he handled himself and handled some... Matter of fact, he and his wife both took a whole lot of criticism this week. And I don't know why they're getting on her, because she was... <laughs> I don't know why at all. I mean, I can obviously see why people get on to your husband. But, you know, not you. So anyway, uh, Mayor David Hillock is here today. David is a wonderful guy that I've very much enjoyed being friends with. He's also a student of history. He's a patriot. He served in our military. And uh, he's, he, I wanted him to come and give us a few minutes about reformers and what they've done in our society. So everybody make him feel a lot more welcome than you did me. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a rough couple of weeks. It's been a rough couple of weeks. But I will tell you what, the best things come out of the roughest couple of weeks. Not always for political figures, but for discussion. I'd like to ask for a volunteer, the young man here in the blue tank top. Can you do me a favor? Can you walk around the corner right there and look at that sign that's on the wall? Turn around and look at the wall right there. No, right this way, this wall. Read that really loud. We're sitting in an elementary school. The school here is teaching these kids on a daily basis to be the change. To be the change we want to see in the world. Unfortunately, that phrase has been adopted by so many political organizations that it doesn't mean much to folks anymore. But it's our, our job to be the change. Unfortunately, when someone tries to, they usually get steamrolled by those who aren't willing to change. As we look back at our nation's history, which is an area I like to study on a lot, study on. I don't study on grammar, apparently. But I do study on history. Um, <laughs> the biggest changes that have occurred, occurred when people got uncomfortable. People weren't comfortable in 70, 1775. In fact, the majority of this country, what was this country, did not agree with the movement toward revolution. Initially, about 10% did. By the time we started fighting the war, about 30% did. So more than the majority of the nation at that time did not agree that we should be fighting a war for independence, but we did. And it led to something that had the potential for greatness. I won't say that it led to greatness because we're still working on that, but it led to the potential for greatness. People were uncomfortable. People took sides. The Federalists and the Tories and the everyone else that was involved in this, in that conflict, took sides. And they didn't agree. People were killed over that one. We don't have to do that anymore. But people are still dying in this country. They're just really little people. Because people aren't standing up for what they believe in. The, the reality is that that's always happened. If you look at this nation in the late 1950s, the days of Medgar Evers and Martin Luther King Jr., people didn't agree with that movement. I was born in Georgia. I had family members who did not agree with that movement. Of course, I wasn't there for that movement. I want to make that real clear. <laughs> um, but I definitely had family members who did not agree with the civil rights movement. Over the next 15 or 20 years, it accomplished something. It accomplished something that was later taken for granted completely, but it accomplished something. And that's been the, that's been the nature of our history through, from the very beginning of our nation. Today, in Little Elm, we're contending with one that's, that's much the same, the, the abolition of abortion. Mr. Bullis and his family have taken a lot of grief in the past couple of weeks. But they've taken it for the wrong reason. People aren't opposed necessarily to the idea that Todd was trying to support. They were upset about the way the message was presented. And I want to challenge you a little bit without getting too gruesome. I know we've got some kids here, so I won't be too gruesome. But 
there were some folks that got out and counter-protested, you know, tried to get their signs in the way of the signs they didn't agree with. I don't really agree with that. I think the, the right way to do it is to let everybody have their voice. They didn't have any problem with the folks showing up in a counter-protest, that they have that right to. Um, I look at things from the position of a public official. My job is not, and, and this, this, this will probably rub some people the wrong way, my job is not to enforce biblical doctrine at the town level. My job is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's the pledge I took when I joined the military. I took a very similar pledge when I was sworn into office. But how would those protesters' opinion have changed if the sign, and I, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone, I'll keep this relatively light, but if instead the sign had been pic a picture of heads on pikes and the sign had said, there is no God but Allah, what would have been the reaction of the community? Would it have been the same? Would they have been upset about the message or the way the message was delivered? What, what if instead... The sign had been a picture of two men lying in bed, and it said, support gay marriage. Would we have had the support for the message, or would the message have gotten lost in the way the message was delivered? It's a difficult question. I, I made the statement on Facebook, and I believe it's true. If there had been a sign that just had a picture of butterflies and sunflowers, and said, God loves you, we would have had just as many people upset. We would have had just as many people upset that there was a sign near a school that said God loves you. We actually do have an atheist organization in the town of Little Elm, and they do give us grief. For many years, they got the name of the Christmas celebration in Little Elm Park changed to Holidays. Now it's called Christmas in the Park. We throw a little Santa in there. Because that's what it is. It's a celebration of Christmas. You can call it, you can have a, you know, if you, want your, if you want whatever else you want, if you want to carry a menorah in the parade, I don't care. But it's a, it's a Christmas celebration. What people have to realize is in our society, in the type of society we've built as a nation, you don't have the right to not be offended. You have the right to avoid being offended but you don't have the right to be unoffended without being inconvenienced. I offered the option to some folks, and this was actually controversial, this one kind of blew my mind. I offered the option to folks to drive around. I even provided a map with alternate directions. There are five entrances to the high school. Todd was standing at, not even at an entrance, you are standing at the corner, but there are five entrances to the school. I said, I really don't care what the school's rules are, frankly. Just drive to another entrance and drop your kids off. And just let the school know if they say you can't drop your kids off there, let them know the only other option is not to bring my kids to school. I assure you, for $58 a day, they'll ask you to drop your kids off at the wrong entrance. <laughs> so there are ways to be unoffended, but it's going to make you go out of your way a little bit. So leave the house five minutes earlier. Plan ahead. Keep your kid from seeing something that's going to scar them for life. I thought that one was pretty funny. I will tell you something right now. There are very few things on this earth that will scar a four-year-old for life. I took my kids to Disney World when they were eight and six. They have no memory of it whatsoever. <laughs> Disney World. They were there for a week. I remember everything that happened, and I have no memory whatsoever. But they have no memory of the trip at all. We had to take them back when they were teenagers, and then they didn't even enjoy it. Because they were just angry teenagers. That's what happens. I will also say to those who are protesting, whatever they're protesting, there is the potential, the great potential, to do more harm than good if your delivery of the message exceeds the message. What did we learn in the social media world over the past couple of weeks? No one was talking about saving kids' lives. They were talking about signs. It reminds me a lot of the, the um, Second Amendment activists that were out last year and the year before, I believe strongly in what they were saying. You have the right to carry an M16 if you want to. That's fine, I don't have any problem with it. Um, I don't think the best place for it is Starbucks. I don't think the best place for the M16 is Target. 
And so what they did is they didn't change the law. The law stayed the same. You still have the right to carry a semi-automatic weapon anywhere you want to. But what they did was turn society against their message. Now, Starbucks has a rule that you can't carry a weapon in Starbucks. Target has a rule that you can't carry a weapon in Target. Virtually every business on the planet now has a sign that says, no weapons are allowed in our facility. So while the message was right, and while the message meant well, the, me the delivery of the message trumped the message itself and turned society against the messenger. There's a risk there, and one that has to be weighed against the benefit of the message. Uh, we live in North Texas. It's not hard to get people to agree, in general, about conservative viewpoints. It's really not. There, there are two powerless things in North Texas. One is, no offense to anyone that's here, being a Democrat is powerless. And number two is a Republican, frankly. Because everyone votes the same way, for the most part. About 94% vote the same way. So one vote tends to mean less because everybody votes the same. So it's not hard to get people to agree with conservative principles, but they may not agree with the way you're delivering the message. It's something to keep in mind. As we look back, and I know I'm not necessarily doing everything Brad wanted me here to talk about the, the rabble-rousers of history, but there are people who bent the law more than it needed to be bent. We, we, Brad and I talked the other day about John Brown. John Brown's raiders, they didn't just agree with the abolition of slavery. They attacked forts and burnt down towns and um, destroyed military uh, installations. They broke the law. Right. They killed a lot of people. They ended up dying themselves. They took over a fort and ended up dying in that fort. That's the extreme. Holding a sign on a corner is not extreme, even though it may be offensive to some. Holding a sign on a corner means you're standing up for something. And I will tell you, the one thing that I got out of this, and Todd's family should respect to a large degree, especially the young men in this family, finally, a man stood up for something in this country. We're missing that. I have no greater admiration than anyone who stands up against evil. I also admire the, the strength that it takes to exercise restraint in the delivery of that message. Frustration has led us to this. Forty years of frustration has led us to this. Even longer than that, really. It's only been 40 years since the law was changed to allow for abortion. But this was going on long before that. Thomas Jefferson had a pretty long speech about abortion among the Native Americans. Abortions have been going on for thousands of years. But we've endorsed it as a society now. So I admire the, the strength to exercise, exercise restraint even in the face of utter stupidity. It's a necessary thing. It's a necessary thing as leaders in the community, as leaders in the church, to deliver the message that needs to be delivered and at the same time delivered in a way that doesn't get the message lost in the delivery of the message. So that's all I've got. I appreciate y'all having me here today. Thanks for talking. <laughs> I am very thankful for Todd, or for, uh, for Todd, yes, and for whoever you are, David. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I called you Todd. I was looking at Todd, trying to talk about you. Uh, and you know what? I didn't, I didn't give him any restrictions, any place he couldn't go. I just said, you know, I, I just was impressed with his eloquence. And any time a guy gets up in a political office and says some things he's just said, that's taking a risk. And I, I thank you that truth means something to you, and, and, you're, and taking a stand means something to you. And uh, you're just, uh, anyway, it's just been a joy to get to know you. And thank you for honoring us by coming here this morning and being a part of this discussion. I really, really appreciate it. And thanks for bringing your wife because she's a lot more fun than you are. But, um, <laughs> uh, okay, so that is, that's the mayor of our town. That's representing kind of the American constitutional uh, process here. What, what's the Bible have to say? Remember our original diagram had reformers and Christians, and those two things are not always the same, but where they intersect, what is this salt and light idea, okay? Um, Let's look at the words of Jesus. Because frankly, the church has had some less than salty moments. Um, 
you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, and some of you guys are going, how does it do that? Well, they had kind of a marsh salt situation there, so it didn't always stay well very long. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Your salt and light. Let the world see your good deeds. And what's the result? They're going, to pray, they're going to praise your Father in heaven. And guess what? That's the first time Jesus called God Father to his disciples. Your Father. He wasn't just the Creator. He wasn't just the Lord. He was their Father. And so it's a huge, huge moment in, a, in Jesus coming and revealing us the Father's heart. So, salt. why do you choose salt and light? Well, salt, incredibly important in the ancient Near East. Still pretty important to us. What would our pretzels do without it? But in the ancient Near East, it flavored food. It retarded decay. It was one of the only ways they could, they could preserve food. And in small doses, it even fertilized their land. Uh, Jesus was saying, guys, you can positively affect the world. You are salt to the world. They need you. Um, it's also an antiseptic. So disciples, it's like he was saying, you could be like a moral disinfectant to this sin-infested world. And that requires virtue. It's not something you can just say. You have to live and back it up. But you can actually help the moral climate of the place you're around. So he said salt, and he also said light. I'm pretty sure you don't need a preacher to tell you that light is a symbol of, of uh, purity, truth, knowledge, revelation. You know, when the light comes in and illuminates things. We use that word in, in the same way now. It's a symbol of God's presence. And so here they are. If salt was kind of exercising a negative function of stopping decay, light is speaking positively of illuminating a sin-darkened world, of coming and being God's light. Like the moon reflects the sun, we're supposed to reflect Jesus' light. And it's warned, there's something real important here, okay? He said a city on a hill cannot be hidden. He was warning his disciples, don't withdraw don't withdraw into cloisters. Don't just get in a fort behind the walls and try to be Christians there. Uh, us four no more. Hold the fort mentality. He said, we got to be out there. We can't be hidden. We have to let this light shine. So it's very important he picked those two things for a reason. All right, I said the church had had some less than salty moments. I think I refer to this quite a bit, but I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and I went to a Southern Baptist seminary and uh, loved it. Learned a lot of great stuff. Can you imagine my horror when I found out that the reason there's a Southern Baptist Convention was because in 1940 or 1840, uh, oh goodness, I've forgotten the date. Anyway, anyway, they split over slavery, and Southern Baptists were not on the right side of that. The Baptists of the time had quit allowing slaveholding Baptists to be missionaries, and they got all upset about this, and they split. Um, most Southern churches. Most Southern white Baptists went from uh, the last thing they wanted was for freedom to be extended to slaves. It never occurred to them that God's creating everyone equal meant slaves. They thought they were God's chosen people and blacks were destined to always be enslaved to God's chosen ones. And they were willing to go to war for that belief. Do you know that in the 1990s is when the Southern Baptist Convention apologized for that? <laughs> Hey, we were on the wrong side of history there. And not only that, we weren't very supportive during the Civil Rights Movement. And so uh, that's just amazing to me. And is there anybody in here that can imagine me getting up in the pulpit and trying to say that white people were God's chosen people? But that was happening. And there were a lot of very wealthy slaveholders in the pews that were, that were very happy with their pastor saying those things. It was a weird time. And it cost a lot of blood in our country to make it right. Um, as I was looking at this, does everybody know the name Frederick Douglass? Douglass a freed slave that became a quite the leader. Um, <laughs> there's an entire transcript of something he uh, just got up. They, they begged him to get up and talk in uh, England at one time. And this is just one paragraph from what he said. 
and it's from his experience. Now, this is just a time capsule back into the, the pre-Civil War days. I have heard sermon after sermon when a slave intended to make me satisfied with my condition, telling me that it is the position of God, that it is the position God intended me to occupy, that if I offend against my master, I offend against God, that my happiness in time and eternity depends on my entire obedience to my master. These are the doctrines taught among the slaves, and the slaveholders themselves have become conscious about holding slaves in bondage, bondage and their consciences have been lulled to sleep by the preaching and the teaching of the Southern American pulpits. There is no place, said an abolitionist in the United States, where sla slavery finds a more secure abode than under the shadow of the sanctuary. Oh, what a horrible statement. The simple fact in itself is that three millions of slaves exist in a land where there are more than two millions of evangelical Christians. Ought to be sufficient to show that Christianity, that ev the ev evangelical religion is not where it, what it ought to be. The words of a guy that lived it not just studied it in the past. It's just hard to believe that there's a time when Christian people would defend something like slavery, isn't it? So reformers came along and tried to open the church's eyes to the evil that was going on, but many just didn't want to hear. And it literally took a war to set even our brothers and sisters in Christ free. So what do we do when we see our faith in conflict with society? When it's legal to do something that is very unjust? Um, well, there's some very specific things that I wanted to end with. And I just want you to think of this section as when Jesus sends you out. Okay? Because there were, there's a, several times where he sent people out, and usually with very similar instructions. Okay? So let's look at these together real quickly. If we go to, uh, to Luke chapter 10, we hear one of these. This is specifically when he sent out 72 of his followers. Earlier, he'd sent out his 12, and here's 72, and, and the instructions were almost identical. But he says this, Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and what he's actually probably mean there was an extra pair of sandals, uh, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. He didn't want them, first of all, to dishonor a family by staying there one night and then going, ooh, got a better deal, I'm going to move over here. He wanted them to be as unobtrusive as possible. Go in, hopefully find a person of peace that would let them stay and stay with them. Um, when you enter a town and, and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Then he says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Okay? That was their actions. They were to go in, first of all, very dependent upon God. Not take coins, not take extra tunics. Uh, not take an extra staff or extra shoes, but just trust that God will provide. If we can't trust that God will provide, how can we expect the people we're talking to that sometimes need great help? How can we expect them to understand that? And then he said, go in and be a good guest. Honor the people that take you in. Be very unobtrusive. Give no thought to whether you're staying in a place you want to stay or eating the things you want to eat. Eat what's put before you, which oddly enough is what they that our missionaries do now. It's why I'm not a missionary, because I don't want to eat things that they serve in other countries. <laughs> Have you seen bizarre foods? Not going there. So anyway, but uh, this is what he said, you know, eat what's put before you. And then he says, heal the sick, be a healing presence. Let them know that the kingdom is here. Look for needs and meet those needs. Those are instructions from Jesus. That's their actions. He also spoke about their attitude. If you go to Matthew 10, chapter 16, he said this in pretty powerful statement here. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I like the way the message translation puts this. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack. So don't call attention to yourselves. Be as cunning as a snake, inoffensive as a dove. Okay? Okay. Snakes were thought of as shrewd because they were quiet, kind of crawled everywhere. They didn't draw a lot of attention to themselves. But when they were ready for action, they were ready for action. So the disciples were supposed to be both prudent or shrewd and innocent towards the people that they were trying to minister to. Okay? 
he picked doves. Dove have, doves have a very interesting trait. They're peaceful birds. They're, they're birds that are re, kind of retiring. If, if other birds come in, the doves leave, okay? Uh, this is how they were told to behave. In another place, it says, if they, don't, if they don't receive you, if they don't receive what you're saying, just shake the dust off your shoes and go on. Um, so that's how they were to behave. They needed to avoid conflicts and attacks where possible. But uh, when these came, they were supposed to just withdraw and go to other towns and just continue to share. Don't let the conflict stop you. Don't let the conflict hang you up. Just go about your business and, uh, and keep, keep on as uh, shrewd as snakes, gentle as doves. Now, when I read all this and I read the commentary about this, it made me think of Romans chapter 12, which we went through last year. And chapter 12 is that wonderful chapter where he starts really laying out what's a Christian life look like. Well, in verse 9 it says, Love must be sincere. Hate or abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Do not repay, uh, jumping down to 17, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, good words. First from Jesus, now from Paul. Um, he's, he's advocating being a peacemaker. Now, he didn't promote it at any price. He said, as far as it depends on you. In some situations, peace may give way to conflict, especially when the truth is involved. But in any case, he said, the, the believer should not be the instigator of trouble under normal circumstances. Now, I'm praying about this because this is huge. And I ask God, please give me insight. What do you mean here? What, what's the best way I can think about this? And guys, I believe this is what we're supposed to get out of this. If anyone's going to get hurt, let it be you. Am I wrong? Isn't that the example of Jesus? Who emptied himself completely of his position in heaven and made of himself nothing, took on the form of a servant, even to the point of death on the cross? If anybody's going to be hurt, let it be you. What's the opposite of that? The religious police in Saudi Arabia, who if they see you violating a religious law, they beat you, or they might cut off your hand, or crucify you, or hang you right there. Or maybe what we're seeing in Iraq and Syria, if you don't convert, you lose your head. In the, in the Christian faith, if anybody's going to get hurt, in the discussion, let it be you. So, how many people think Jesus knows what he's talking about? Good, most of us are on board with Jesus. I love that. I'll give you one more shot. How many people think Jesus knows what he's talking about? Hey, that's a good vote right there. Well, let's look at his last words to us before he went back to heaven. He said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, when it comes down to that moment where it might be us that's getting hurt, it's good to remember that Jesus is with you. And it's good to remember that he went all the way there before. He conquered death. It has no more sting. Some people get to graduate early. Most of us will never have to worry about that. But there are places right now in the Middle East and other places where the minute you identify with Jesus, your life may be forfeit. It's you, are, you are saying, yes, I will follow Jesus even if it costs me my life. We really don't have to worry about that. In Little Elm, most people are pretty on board with Jesus. But even when we get harassed, even when we find ourselves taking a stand or a position that's not that popular, it's good to know that he's with us, right? And it can be very tempting to take on the world's tactics, but our kingdom works upside down from that. We can't take on the world's tactics. Our job is the Great Commission. And anything that hinders that, think about this, guys. Anything that hinders the Great Commission is dooming your part of the world, the ones you're responsible for, to hell. You may have responsibility for even a very small circle of friends, but you don't want anything getting in the way from them knowing Jesus and being able to experience eternity. 
So this is a huge responsibility and something we have to take very seriously. If you follow Jesus, you are going to be in conflict with our culture. It just He said it himself, and it's proven every day. Just make sure that you respond like your Savior told you to do. If you can do that, you'll have the Holy Spirit's power at your back. And you will always have your pastor behind you. Maybe 30 or 40 yards behind you. <laughs> but I'll be behind you. Can't imagine much better than walking through some of these things with you guys. So, um, it's always important to remember, one of my seminary professors at my Southern Baptist Seminary said this. Don't come back and tell me you're being persecuted for Jesus if you're just being a jerk. All right? So the two things are not always synonymous. But if your faith has brought you in conflict with the society and your community, just know you are not alone. Not only is Jesus with you, and not only will your sometimes brave pastor be with you, but you have a lot of brothers and sisters that will hold you up and talk you through these things. And uh, I think that's pretty awesome. Agreed? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for once again being with us as we meet. I thank you for glorious moments of worship and incredible words that call us to much greater things. Father, I pray that everyone in here will have the joy and the privilege of being salt and light to their families, to their friends, to their neighbors, to their co-workers. I pray that you would elevate them to be salt and light to the community. These people carry wonderful, wonderful gifts inside. And I pray that the enemy cannot uh, confuse them or scare them or do anything, Father, that would distract them from their mission. We do pray for those in this community that uh, have had very, very... Um, harsh feelings this week and father we pray that uh, if those discussions continue that we can represent you well but uh, Lord this is the thing we want the most for you to be lifted high for the attention to be on you because you have this way of drawing all men to you when you are just if there's anyone in this room that does not understand what it means to have a personal relationship with you to have that Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them I pray that this would be the day that they would just recognize you for who you are and believe in the one that God sent, Jesus Christ, and begin to follow in the steps of eternity. And Father, just help them have the courage to talk to me or one of their other brothers and sisters to make that a decision public. Uh, it's the first step in taking a stand for what's right. And I, uh, I thank you, Father, for uh, sharing that salvation and that joy with each one of us. We love you. We give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.